So here we are in the real world. This is the world that we live in, the world that we want to try to know. And pretty much through now at least all recorded human history, uh, we've been interested in trying to understand the world. If for no other reason than how to try to live in it. Uh, now in ancient Greece, the poets uh, preceded the philosophers in trying to provide an explanation. You know, even at this point, uh, the philosophers didn't really exist. They were pretty much just the poets. Now, you know, the book mentions two. Uh, we got Homer and Hesiod. And Homer, uh, you know, saw the world. He looked around the world. And he, he did recognize that there was kind of a causal order, that there was some kind of regularity, you know, to the seasons. And, you know, when you poured water on the ground on a seed, or the seed sprouted into a flower, and so on and so forth. However, uh, there was a lot of, probably there's a lot just of, of suffering in the, in the world for Homer. He thought probably too much suffering uh, for there to be any kind of sense or meaning or uh, a moral order to the world. He didn't think the world was very good for people. Now, on the other hand, you have Hesiod. Then Hesiod also recognized that there was regularity to the universe. But where Homer saw a kind of uh, corruptness to the world, Hesiod thought that there was still an underlying moral order. You know, Homer thought that, well, both Homer and Hesiod thought that the gods were in control of the world, of the universe, and Homer thought that uh, the gods were capricious and fickle, a lot like people. And uh, Hesiod, well, Hesiod thought that there was still an underlying order, an underlying moral order. Now today we, we do uh, kind of contrast both of these, uh, both of these views. There are still people that hold both of these views uh, all at the same time. So we really can't, uh, uh, you know, fault Homer and Hesiod for having these kinds of views. There are plenty of people today uh, who we might call on the one hand to be pessimists, those would be like Homer, and on the other hand would be optimists, those would be like Hesiod. Now like I said, these uh, Homer and Hesiod preceded the philosophers. The philosophers did something different than the poets. To understand who the philosophers were in contrast to the poets, uh, it'll be kind of helpful to understand their motivations. Now, philosophers were different than the poets. Uh, one, for one thing, they're very different from the poets in that the philosophers didn't try to appeal to the gods to explain the universe. Um, they tried to appeal to what we can know, what we experience. Um, Philosophers, are the, the word philosopher literally translated, literally translated means lover of wisdom. Now, we don't understand wisdom too well uh, in our culture. I mean, one way to think about wisdom is comparing it to knowledge. Now, wisdom is not knowledge, uh, at least under some senses of the term. Uh, knowledge, you know, the contents of knowledge would be something like facts, right? If you open up your textbook that's full of uh, knowledge, most of your professors, if not all of your professors, have a lot of knowledge, they have uh, information of a lot of facts. Wisdom is not necessarily knowledge. Wisdom uses knowledge, but it's not necessarily knowledge. The closest that we get to knowledge, uh, sorry, wisdom in our culture, and like I said, we don't do it very well, the closest we get to wisdom in our culture is something like the self-help self section in Barnes & Noble. And pretty much every book written in that section is really bad. Um, it's a lot of nonsense, frankly. Now, wisdom is uh, the you know in investigating how to live well. Wisdom is how to live well. We might even call it the secret to happiness. This is what the philosophers were interested in, uh, and this is what they were trying to do when they first asked questions about the world, about the universe. Another really significant difference, or a really significant difference between the poets and the philosophers was the use of reason. Now reason we can probably best understand is using uh, experiences and uh, inferences to draw conclusions. Uh, the poets really didn't use uh, reason to do that. The philosophers were really the first that tried to uh, take what they knew from the experiences and draw inferences about the truth. Uh, the poets, on the other hand, used emotion and drama. Now, I'm not saying these things, that emotion and drama are necessarily bad, right? 
Um, I mean, there are plenty of people that do. <laughs> there are plenty of people that argue for the primacy of reason over emotion, and there are plenty of people who argue for the primacy of emotion over reason. Um, in most cases, or pretty much all cases, if someone is arguing for the primacy of reason, they themselves tend to be very cerebral. And uh, for the people that argue for the primacy of emotion, they themselves tend to be very emotional. So I'll let you draw whatever conclusion you want from that. Now, I am not saying that um, you know, reason is necessarily better than emotion. That's a, a topic for class, perhaps. All I'm saying is that there is a significant difference. The way we usually identify it today is something like the difference between the mind and the heart. And trying to investigate the world through the mind is more or less the way of the philosopher. Trying to investigate the world through the heart is more or less the way of the poet. Now, as I said, the philosopher is very interested in trying to uh, investigate how to live well. But there are lots of topics in philosophy besides that. And there's a very long list of topics in philosophy besides that. And we could pretty much group them under four kinds. You know, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, and logic. Metaphysics is basically uh, what is real. Epistemology is how do we know. Ethics is how are we to live our life. And logic is how to make good inferences. And you might wonder, you know, for a group of people interested in learning how to live well, why they would even bother investigating the rest of these other kinds of fields. Well, you really can't escape these other questions when you're trying to figure out how to live well. If you're trying to figure out, you know, what is the good life for a person? Well, you have to answer, what is a person? And that's a question of metaphysics. And even uh, asking the question, or you're trying to give this definition of what a person is, very qu quickly the question becomes, well, how do I know that? Can I know that? Well, that's epistemology. You know, ethics is uh, really in interested in this, pretty much is interested in this overall question, trying to answer how we are to live our, li uh, live our lives well. So it would ask, what is the good life? What does it mean to have a good life? And then finally, logic is, is pervasive to the whole uh, spectrum because we always want to have good conclusions. We always want to have conclusions that uh, give us the truth. So philosophers are different from uh, the poets in some really significant ways. Um, they're a lot like Hesiod, and or at least some of them are a lot like Hesiod in, in trying to say that there is this moral order, there is a meaning to existence. But as opposed to the poets, uh, philosophers don't often appeal to anything like the gods or any traditional notions of the gods. They don't try to appeal to any kind of revealed texts, uh, like you know the the first covenant, the uh, you know like the, you know the like in any of the books of the Old of the First uh, Testament, any of the books of the New Testament, the Bhagavad Gita, um, they don't uh, try to appeal to uh, the Quran, anything like that. Uh, and so they didn't appeal to the Greek gods of the time. Instead, they're appealing to uh, what we can know from experience and inference. So to, uh, the first philosopher we're going to look at is Thales. And to get an idea of what Thales is doing, we kind of have to put ourselves in his situation. Remember, this is ancient Greece. They didn't have a whole lot of knowledge, or you know, what we call knowledge today. Um, they didn't have an explanation for what everything is. So to, to understand what's going on, I mean, look, look, at, look at what's happening over here. We've got a wide variety of things, right? We've got a lot of different... Uh, we got some uh, flowers, we got some... Um, well, this shows my lack of knowledge of botany. We've got some trees, we've got some large flowering plants, we've got some mostly leafy plants, things like this. Now, we could understand all of these, we try to explain all of these or define all of these as plants. Right? So that part's simple enough, but there's more than, than plants here. We've got plants, we've got brick, we've got natural stone, we've got cement and mortar, we've got air. We, uh, we ha there's, you can't see it, but there's water in the ground. There's uh, different elements, uh, or excuse me, minerals in the ground. There's me. There's my sunglasses and my hat. You know, the sunglasses, the hat, me, the plants, the brick, the mortar, the cement, the minerals, the water, the air. These are all very different things. Very different things. Now, he here's the question. If we have all of these wide and varied things, how come they work together so well? Are they just sort of pre-programmed to work that way? And if so, what's doing the programming? Uh, if they were just fundamentally different kinds of things, uh, wouldn't there be more chaos? You know, there's, there's actual order to the universe. If we we're just dealing with fundamentally different kinds of particles or laws or whatever, there wouldn't be anything to begin with. Right? 
So that's that's Thali's situation. He's looking at the world and says, hey, there's a wide variety of things. Since they're existing together in the same way, in this order, in this universe, they must be fundamentally of the same kind of thing. Just how we look at all of these all of this greenery here and we say fundamentally they're all the same kind of thing. They are plants. Well, he pushes it further. Plants, air, water, stone, you, me, all of it must fundamentally be the same kind of thing. In essence, what he's doing is he's saying all of these defined things, all of these existing things must be explained or known in terms of one. One thing is going to explain all of it. Now, we agree with Daly's project. We do the same thing today. We try to explain all of this in terms of matter. And we try, to, we try even further to try to understand what matter is. So this is Thaley's really big insight. Wide variety of things. All of it can be explained in terms of one. So Thaley's is trying to explain, describe what fundamentally underlies everything, what everything is made of, the stuff. You know, we, today we call it matter. But what does Thales think? Well, Thales thinks it's water. Water uh, fundamentally makes up everything. Everything at its essence, at its core, is water. Now, before you laugh or snicker too much at Thales, remember a few things. You know, you may believe that all of matter is fundamentally made up of atoms, which are made up of protons, neutrons, electrons, and so on and so forth. But you have the benefit of 25 centuries or so of human investigation. You are standing on the shoulders of giants. And by the way, Thales is one of those giants. So also remember, Thales lived in Miletus, which was a city on a coastline. Water was quite literally the ebb and flow of life. Your day revolved around the tides. Um, you know, when you look around today, water is everywhere. I mean, we know that this is, we know this right here is an artificial spring, but there are springs that you find in nature which resemble this a lot. Water seems to just flow out of the ground. Water falls out of the sky. You are something like 80% water. Right? When, when you are cut, you bleed. Liquid comes out. Without water, things die. They shrivel up. They no longer exist. It's not hard to think that water is in everything and somehow constitutes everything. So Thales is really not that crazy. What Thales is doing is he is using observation. What he's trying to do is say, look, if, if there's something that explains everything, if there's some fundamental reality to everything, then everything has got to have this in common. And when he looked out in the world, the thing that he saw that everything had, had most in common was water. Thales was using observation to draw inference. Does that sound remotely familiar to things that we do today? So Thales thinks that he is going to find this one thing that unites everything, that explains everything with water. Anaximander uh, was Thales' student. Now it's kind of a kind of a tradition uh, amongst philosophers that the student uh, questions and rejects the teacher's teachings. Uh, we're kind of like the dark Jedi that way. <laughs> so uh, Anaximander um, rejected Thales' teaching that everything was water. Now what he didn't reject was that there's something that fundamentally unites everything, that there's something that explains everything. He didn't reject it. He thought that there was something for which everything else is made. He just didn't think it was water. But he did something a little bit interesting. Instead of bringing some other kind of fundamental stuff to the table, Annex Mander questioned, well, what would it mean to say that any of these things can explain everything else? So let me, let me try to get at, at Annex Amanda's point. Everything that you see, that you experience, that you taste, touch, or feel, you have 
because it's a defined thing. It's a limited thing, right? It has edges, it has qualities. There's something about it uh, which makes it that thing and specifically not something else. So water, liquid, sometimes cool, clear, tasteless, all right? Um, it has a certain chemical compound, dihydrogen monoxide, right? This is what makes water, water. And what makes water, water is what makes, is what, is something that makes me different. I am constituted of water, but I've got so much more going on. I'm made up of so many more things. And I have qualities that water could never have. Water cannot perceive things. Water can't have senses. So when we define something, we're saying not only what it is, but what it is not. We're providing a limit to that thing. Everything you perceive, everything you experience, is a limited thing. It's a defined thing. So Anaximander wonders, well, what, how are these defined things supposed to explain everything else? Because when you provide a definition for something, you provide a definition in terms of something else. What is water? Dihydrogen monoxide. What is that? Well, there's hydrogen, there's oxygen, there's di for two, mono for one hydrogen. We got two atoms of hydrogen, one, one atom of oxygen. So then we now have high, um, water defined in terms of two, one, hydrogen, oxygen, and atoms. So when you define, you get a, probably at least one more thing that needs to be defined, if not a bunch of other things that need to be defined. So here's uh, Anaximander to Thales. Thales says, hey, everything's water. Well, he says, okay, what's water? Oh, well, water is this cool liquid stuff that uh, gives life and it falls from the sky. It's like, okay, well, now what's life? What's me? What's liquid? What's the sky? And Eximander says, anytime you offer a definition to explain something, you provide it something else that needs to be explained. He doesn't think that any defined thing can do it. Water can't explain everything else because I still need to explain water. So anytime you bring a defined thing to do any of the explaining, you're running into this problem. You're already providing a further need for an explanation. And very quickly this sets up an infinite regress of explanation. And what I mean by that is, you know, use the water example. Well, I've defined water in terms of one, two, hydrogen, oxygen, and atom. Well, what's one? Well, one is not two. One is singular. One uh, is uh, not the existent, you know, not nothing, right? Well, then that's a further definition needs to be defined. Well, then what's two? Well, two is one more than one. So it's relying on the definition of one, which itself needs a further definition. Well, what's hydrogen? Well, you got to contrast hydrogen. Probably uh, we're, what we're really tempted to do today to uh, define hydrogen is in terms of one proton, one neutron. And now we got to define proton and neutron. Oxygen. Same thing. We're going to give it in terms of its uh, uh, atomic structure, which is going to include an electron. Now we're going to uh, define what an electron is. So, with the infinite regress of explanation, whatever you provide as an explanation itself needs to be explained. Can that ever explain anything? Well, think about it. You know, if, if everything that you provide as an explanation itself needs an explanation, you wonder if there's ever an explanation to begin with. Right? Everything you provide as an explanation needs to be explained. If you say, well, not everything, you know, some things are just explained in and of themselves, like then, you, then you're talking about something that doesn't have a definition. Okay? And we'll get to that in a second. But if you try to say that everything that offers an, that's offered as an explanation itself needs to be explained, one wonders if there's ever an explanation to begin with. And that's what an infinite regress of explanation is. We can even call it an infinite regress of definition, if you really want to. So, Anaximander looks at this problem and says, Yeah, Thales, you told me what water, you know, that water uh, constitutes everything, but I still don't know what water is. Water explains everything, but I don't know what water is. Give me whatever defined thing you want. I'm still going to want to know what that is. And you're going to create the infinite regress of explanation. The infinite regress of explanation can't do any explaining. Now, obviously, we can't explain everything around us. So, Anaximander says, if there's something that explains everything else around us, explains all these defined things, it can't itself be a defined thing. 
what doesn't have a definition, what doesn't have a limit, is what explains everything else. And he calls this the boundless. The boundless. The boundless has no edges. The boundless has no limit. The boundless has no quality. It has no weight. It has no structure. Because all these are limits. And yet the boundless is the most real thing. Because all these defined things, in some way, come from the boundless. Well, it's a beautiful day outside, thank the Boundless. And you might wonder how anything like the Boundless could be conceivable. Well, Annex Commander has his reasons. And something like the Boundless t pops up time and time again in human intellectual history. And we'll, we'll see that later on through the semester. Now, I'm not going to provide Annex Commander's actual argument. I'm going to provide a reconstruction of his argument using more or less contemporary terms and, and rules of, of reason. I'll provide this argument using number proposition form. Um, this it will help with ease of reference and, and to, see where, uh, uh, to see where conclusions are drawn from. So the first proposition just is uh, uh, Bailey's insight that if everything is going to be explained in terms of the one, right, then it's something that everything has in common. The second proposition is Anaximander's contribution that uh, you know, if there's going to be this uh, uh, defined, uh, there's going to be this you know, explanation of the defined thing that it itself, this explanation thing, cannot itself be defined. The third proposition is that if it's not defined, then it's limitless being, it's the boundless. Now so far, just these first three are premises. These are just these initial reasons, I might even say intuitions, offered as evidence. The fourth premise is an inference drawn from the previous three. Now notice the parenthetical notation I have here. Uh, the parenthetical notation shows uh, where this inference comes from. It comes from the first three. And it's using a rule called hypothetical syllogism. Hypothetical syllogism is real simple. Uh, if we have these conditionals, if P then Q, right? Uh, conditional is if P then Q. If we have if P then Q, and if Q then R, then we infer if P then R. So for example, if, something's a, if an animal is a dog, then it's a mammal. If an animal is a mammal, then it's warm-blooded. So we infer if something is a dog, then it's warm-blooded. The fifth proposition is uh, just the assertion that we all believe today that all these defined things can be explained. Uh, and the uh, sixth proposition is that, therefore, all of this is the boundless. It's the boundless. It's unlimited reality. Now, if you're going to reject the conclusion, since this is a, since this is a deductively valid argument, if you're going to reject the conclusion, if you're going to reject the boundless, you've got to reject one of the premises. And you can't reject a premise that's inferred from others. You've got to start with the premises that are just taken is basic, just taken at the first, uh, first spot. So maybe think about that. Which of those premises do you reject? Annex Jimenez was Annex Amanda's student. And just as Annex Amanda turned on his teacher, Annex Jimenez turns on Annex Amanda. I'm just kidding, really. But Anaximander did reject uh, Anaximander. Anax did reject Anaximander's conclusion, and likely you do too, right? And remember when I was describing the boundless? I was not describing the boundless, right? Because the boundless can't be described. The boundless is incomprehensible. You can't have a picture of it in your head. You can't even define it. Why? Because it's something that can't be defined. And this is something that Anaximanders can't let go of. Say, look, Anaximander. You know, so here's Anaximander. Say, hey, Anaximander, what is everything? And Anaximander says, it's the boundless. Anaximander says, great, what's the boundless? Anaximander says, I cannot tell you. Wait, what? How does that explain anything? 
How's that offer a definition or describe the fundamental reality of, of it at all? It doesn't help me one bit whatsoever. You probably reach the same conclusion. I tell you that everything is the boundless, and you think, no, it can't be, because there is nothing that the boundless is like. It's actually not even true, it's everything, right? The boundless is everything. It's unlimited reality. <coughs> <coughs> so to say that what explains everything is a self unknowable doesn't help you one bit in trying to understand all of reality. And this is something that Annex Manus couldn't accept. Annex Jimenez rejects Annex Jimenez's conclusion, and likely you do too, for pretty much the sketch uh, that I just gave earlier. Now, we're, we're going to look at a reconstruction of Annex Jimenez's argument. Pretty much every argument we look at this semester will be a reconstruction. Right? Now, Annex Jimenez provides basically, or what we're going to provide is, is a reductio ad absurdum. Now, reductio is an argument where its sole purpose is to prove that some proposition is false. All right? How do you do that? Well, first you assume it's true. Wait, what? Yeah, yeah, you assume it's true, okay? And from the assumption that it's true, you derive some kind of silly implication, some silly conclusion. Okay? Or maybe sometimes you uh, follow, or you, you, I'm sorry, you derive uh, something that's just blatantly false, okay? And, or maybe sometimes you derive a direct contradiction. Con direct contradiction is both the assertion of a proposition and its denial. So if your assumption uh, implies uh, Rex is a dog and Rex is not a dog, well then there's something wrong with your assumption, namely it's, it's false. Um, Annex and Menace does, what we're going to look at is pretty much what Annex and Menace does, and it's a reductio against the idea that there is the boundless. So the first proposition is just the assumption, right, just the assumption that there is the boundless, and this is what explains, uh, that this what explains everything else. It, ex it explains all defined things. The second proposition is pretty straightforward. It's what we were talking about earlier. It's like, if something is not defined, okay, then it's not comprehensible. It's not comprehensible. The third proposition takes this incomprehensibility and implies that it can't explain. Incomprehensible things can't explain. The fourth proposition is again using hypothetical syllogism and the second and third. It's just like, if something is, is, uh, is not defined, then it can't explain. So we have the fifth proposition then, and this follows by modus ponens, and it's just the conclusion that the boundless cannot explain. Well, the sixth proposition uses a rule called conjunction introduction. A conjunction is real simple. All it does is it takes two propositions and put them together with the word and. So if you conclude that Rex is a dog and, Re and, you, and you also conclude that Rex is a mammal, then you can infer Rex is a dog and Rex is a mammal. Simple. So the sixth proposition just is this, and it basically says the boundless explains that the boundless cannot explain. That's a contradiction. Since we derive this contradiction from the initial assumption, the, the last proposition is the conclusion, and, it, and the conclusion is that the boundless, it is false that the boundless is uh, undefined and it explains. So Annex Jimenez has rejected Annex Amander's uh, idea of the boundless. The boundless reduces to absurdity. He constructs a, and we saw a construction of reductio ad absurdum against uh, Anaximander's claim. So we're back at this question. What is it that fundamentally constitutes all of reality? You're looking at it. It's air. Air is even more present than water. You cover it, you deprive something of air, it dies. Water falls from the air, right? So really not, you know, so for any reason you think that water might be the fundamental, fundamental thing that makes up all reality, well, air precedes water. It's there, it's everywhere. Things motion off of air to become water. Water falls to the ground, water becomes earth. Earth becomes fire, fire returns to air. Well, that's a lot to take in one day. I don't know about you, 
we're talking about all these ideas kind of worn me out. What have we looked at? We looked at the idea of these early philosophers trying to fundamentally to explain everything, to unite everything in terms of the one. They at least said it was water. Anaximander provides an argument saying, look, you can't, def you can't explain or unite all the defined things in terms of one of the things that needs to be defined. So, what explains or unites everything is the boundless. The boundless is at best difficult to accept. For one thing, you can't understand it. That's part of what it means to be the boundless. Anaximander, Anaximenes rejects Anaximander's, Anaximander's conclusion because of that. We saw that argument. Now, as I said, with these arguments, you have to reject, you can't just reject the, uh, the, uh, the conclusion and walk away. You have to reject one of the premises. So if you reject Anaximander's argument, if you, if you buy what Anaximander has to say and shows that the uh, idea that boundless is, derives this contradiction, then you still have to show which of the premises that Anaximander thinks is true is actually false. You have to provide your own argument. Suppose you side with Anaximander. Anaximander provides a reductio, concluding that the boundless is impossible because it drives this contradiction. So if you, re if you side with Anaxim Anaximander and you reject Anaximander, you still have to reject a premise. And that's where the hard work comes in. Is everything explained in terms of some one defined thing? Or is it explained in terms of the limitless? You can't accept both. It's one or the other. And that's what makes philosophy interesting. Your beliefs have consequences. Even some of the simple beliefs that you have have deep consequences. And the hard work is not in figuring out I mean, it's at least figuring out what's true and false. That's part of it. The other hard work is figuring out what you can accept. Now, I know I've had a long day. We'll talk about these ideas some more in class.